4,000 years ago, in the cradle of civilization, the mighty King Gilgamesh built the great city of Uruk. Its walls stood higher and stronger than any in Mesopotamia. Its craftsmanship surpassed all others. And at the base of its gates, at the foundation of the city walls, there lies a stone of lapis lazuli. It is here that the story of Gilgamesh is carved. Gilgamesh, one-third human and two-thirds god, the strongest superhuman that ever existed. It was he who in his glory built the great walls of Uruk to keep his people safe from outside forces, but not from himself. He oppresses his people, and so they cry out to the sky god Anu. In response, Anu creates the wild man, Enkidu, to plague Gilgamesh's city. The wild man begins to attack the shepherds, killing their livestock and depriving them of food. Complaints are brought before Gilgamesh, and the great king sends Shamhat, a temple harlot, to seduce Enkidu. In his wisdom, Gilgamesh knows that bodily contact between the two will tame the wild man, and he will lose his savagery. Upon their return to Uruk, Shamhat and Enkidu find Gilgamesh attending a wedding. He demands that as king it is his right to be first to sleep with the bride. Enkidu is outraged and challenges Gilgamesh to a test of strength. Should Gilgamesh be unable to pass Enkidu and enter the temple, then he must give up his right. Late into the day they fight. Until finally, as the moon takes to the sky, Gilgamesh gains the upper hand, forcing Enkidu to concede his superiority. The wise king, however, honors Enkidu's wishes, and they return to his palace as friends. A few years pass in Uruk, and Gilgamesh and Enkidu grow lazy. So the king proposes a great adventure to the southern cedar forests, to slay the demon Humbaba and cut down his trees. Enkidu protests at first, but eventually gives in. The journey through the deserts are harsh, but the warriors travel on. Each night, Gilgamesh dreams terrible dreams. In the first, he sees Enkidu lying still in bed. When he awakes, Enkidu tells them that it means they shall be victorious in their coming battle and return home safely. In the second, he sees a giant man whose flesh is made of stone, his huge fist wrapped around Gilgamesh's waist. Again, Enkidu claims it is a good omen, and that Gilgamesh's legacy will be lifted to the heavens. Into the glorious cedar forest they stride, and before their strong axes, the trees begin to fall. The ferocious Humbaba, half demon, half ogre, hears the crashing and falls upon the king. Finally, the killing blow is dealt. From the tallest tree in the forest, Gilgamesh and Enkidu cut a mighty gate for the walls of Uruk. They build rafts from the remaining trees and float down the Euphrates River to their city. Upon their return to Uruk, however, Enkidu falls ill. This time it is the wild man who is plagued by frightening dreams. He finds himself in the house of dust, surrounded by the shadows of his ancestors. The spirit of Humbaba appears and curses Enkidu. Sitting at his bedside, Gilgamesh listens as his friend describes the netherworld. The house where the dead dwell in total darkness, where they drink dirt and eat stone, where they wear feathers like birds, where no light ever invades their everlasting darkness, where the door and the lock of hell is coated with thick dust. When I entered the house of dust, on every side the crowns of kings were heaped. After twelve long days, Enkidu falls silent. 
Gilgamesh laments the loss of his friend and determines not to share his fate. He learns of an ancient being, the only man to gain immortality, and once again he sets out from Uruk. His first destination is Mount Mashu, which guards the rising and the setting of the sun. Upon his arrival, Gilgamesh encounters two gigantic scorpions. They laugh at him and tell him his quest is futile, but still they allow him to pass. Beyond Mount Mashu is the Land of Night, a dark, jagged tunnel that the sun travels through each night. Gilgamesh travels 11 leagues before the light begins to glimmer behind him. Just as the sun is about to catch up, Gilgamesh emerges from the tunnel into a paradise. From atop a hill overlooking the waters of death, Gilgamesh sees the boat that will carry him to his final destination. But blocking his path are two huge stone creatures sleeping on the shore. After a brief fight, the Colossi are defeated, their stony bodies scattered across the sand. The king notices an old man bent over a tall walking stick, his figure draped in black. The man introduces himself as Urshanabi, the boatman, and scolds Gilgamesh for killing the giants, who are the only creatures capable of touching the waters of death. Three hundred trees are demanded of Gilgamesh, and from these trees a thousand oars, for each one will dissolve upon contact with the water. Gilgamesh sets to work, and by the next morning the oars are complete. Urshanabi pushes the boat out into the waters, and the pair are soon encompassed by mist and shadow. The voyage is long, and the king asks Urshanabi about the Ancient One. He is told of the time before the Great Flood, and of the gods' secret council, where they resolved to destroy the world in a great storm. He is told of the god Ea, who warned the Ancient One, and told him to gather all living things in a boat. He is told of the storm, and how when the black clouds arrived, even the gods were frightened. As the boatman's story comes to an end, the bottom of the boat hits soft sand. The mist parts to reveal an island, deserted apart from a small cottage. At the door waits the Ancient One. In exchange for eternal life, the Ancient One challenges Gilgamesh to stay awake for six days and seven nights. But as soon as he finishes speaking, Gilgamesh falls to the ground in a deep sleep. The Ancient One goes inside and asks his wife to bake a loaf of bread for each day the king sleeps. Time passes, and when Gilgamesh awakes, he denies sleeping. The Ancient One shows him the loaves of bread laid out before him, each in its own state of decay. Gilgamesh is distraught, his opportunity for immortality lost, he begs the Ancient One for another chance. He tells the king of a plant, hidden at the bottom of the ocean, that will restore Gilgamesh's youth. Back the king travels, across the waters of death, through paradise and the land of night. He ties stones to his feet, and marches down into the depths of the ocean. He emerges hours later with the plant, and collapses on the shore, while he sleeps, a snake moves down from the dunes and eats the plant. Its skin is shed and its body revitalized. When Gilgamesh awakes, he sees the snake reborn and knows his hope is lost. The road back to Uruk seems long and harsh beneath the feet of the king. When the great walls rise up in the distance, he stops and falls to his knees. He raises his arms and praises the walls of Uruk, his finest achievement. For it is not man's fate to live forever, but for his creations to carry his name 
into generations to come. Four thousand years ago, in the cradle of civilization, the mighty King Gilgamesh built the great city of Uruk. Its walls stood higher and stronger than any in Mesopotamia. Its craftsmanship surpassed all others. And at the base of its gates, at the foundation of the city walls, there lies a stone of lapis lazuli. It is here that the story of Gilgamesh is carved.